If you all want in preparation to when the third judge gets here and we start, you can put your topics in the chat. Um, will they be able to see it if they come in after we send it? Oh, good point. Probably not. So you could definitely wait until the third judge gets here, or you could send it now and then send it again to give you something to do. Okay, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs>
Hey, we got a third judge. Yeah, okay. Great, that means I can stop trying to get into the judges lounge via a different browser. Okay, hey everybody. Congratulations on making it to original oratory quarterfinals. Yay! Um, does anyone want have the desire to run this, Judge Gupta or Judge Perez? No. Okay, cool. I will run it. Awesome. So I'm just going to take a roll really fast. And please let me know if I mispronounce your name so that I can correct it and make sure I pronounce it the way that your name is. And um, on my ballot, I have that no one is double entered. So if you are double entered, please let me know so that I can move around the speaking order. And um, if everyone wants to re-put in your topics, I know I asked you to do it earlier, but if you want to re-put it in uh, the chat so that Judge Gupta can see what your topic is, that would be absolutely fantastic. Christian, are you here? Yes, I am here. Awesome. Kahani, are you here? I'm here, yeah. Is that how you pronounce your name? Yeah, that's right. Cool. Elizabeth. Yes, I'm here. Fantastic. Casey. Okay, we're missing Casey, but I'm sure that they will come. Paige. Here and present. Awesome. Blythe. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. Thank is you. that is that is that how you pronounce your name, Blythe? Yes, you got it. Okay. Cool. Thank Perfect. you. All right. Um. So as soon as the judges are ready, we can go ahead and get started. Are y'all ready? Yeah, I'm good to go. Yep. Cool. I'm ready. Awesome. Okay, well then let's get this round started. I'm excited. I think it's going to be wonderful. So Christian, why don't you kick us off? Hi, can everyone hear and see me all right? Yes. Okay, great. And I will not be needing time signals. And I'm ready whenever you are. So can you just give me an indication? It was the best dream I'd ever had because after magically clearing through several break rounds, I'd made it to finals. And I mean, it was such a good dream. I was hitting every line and every joke perfectly. The audience was laughing. Everything was in its proper place. But suddenly this dreamlike performance came to a grinding halt. Literally, I'd forgotten my speech. And I wish this were the point where I could tell you that I woke up in a cold sweat, but unfortunately, this tragic tale is very painfully real. Afterwards, I asked my coach if I'd even deserve to be in that final round after all, because despite making a very honest and very human mistake, I'd become convinced that this one failure had invalidated my entire career as an orator. And unfortunately, from debate to the classroom and the workplace, my way of thinking is far from uncommon. First coined by psychologists Pauline Rose Clance and Susan Imes in 1978, the imposter syndrome refers to a phenomenon where individuals believe they are imposters, undeserving of their successes despite being more than qualified. And while this syndrome impacts everyone, as the BBC notes in July of 2020, women of color are by far the most likely group to be impacted. Yet despite knowing this, our conversation surrounding the imposter syndrome rarely centers and often excludes women of color, leaving millions subject to believing that their successes simply aren't good enough. In order to achieve everything that we're capable of, we must begin to actively combat the imposter syndrome among women of color. So today, let's go to a speech round. First, Let's write on the chalkboard how traditional views of the imposter syndrome exclude women of color. Next, let's transition to how a lack of representation exacerbates the syndrome. And finally, we'll make it to, and hopefully not forget, some solutions. Because as a member of a group that has had to work so hard for all of our achievements, 
it's about time we stop pretending to be imposters. While certainly my epic fail in finals is pretty relatable, I do have a small disclaimer that this isn't the most relatable speech. Because while everyone can experience the imposter syndrome, the way women of color face it is pretty unique. I mean, you've got racism and sexism combining to form a fascinating mix of low self-esteem and misery. And one of the many ways in which women of color have unique experience with the imposter syndrome begins in its history. As I mentioned before, in 1978, Pauline Rose Clance and Susan Imes observed what they called the imposter phenomenon in a group of 150 high achieving women. But the problem with this study is that high achieving women was really colorblind language for white women. Like most studies, their research offered no insight as to how this syndrome impacted women of color, let alone any other ethnic or gender group. And as psychologist Dr. Lincoln Hill notes in her 2019 Medium article, Traditional views of the imposter syndrome as either simply race-based or gender-based neglect to consider how racism and sexism interlock to form a nuanced and exacerbated form of oppression. And we don't make our research intersectional. We can't find intersectional solutions. The original 1978 study found that intensive therapy was able to improve symptoms of the imposter syndrome among the women tested. But as a 2020 American Counseling Association article notes, a historic lack of access to mental health care in minority communities makes this recommendation virtually useless for women of color. In order to eradicate the imposter syndrome, we must understand the imposter syndrome for everyone. And it deserves to be understood. Because women of color are high achieving women too. Okay, that was kind of heavy. So I think to lighten things up, I'll tell a joke. Okay, here it goes, here it goes. Society valuing women of color. Get it? It's funny because it doesn't happen. On a completely different note, my coach says that I often struggle with being funny. And while certainly I may have my own issues with humor, as a society, we have an issue with not representing women of color. When we fail to represent women of color in meaningful ways, we contribute to the imposter syndrome. Women of color already face an overwhelmingly low amount of representation in high achieving areas. Psychology, em, psychologist Emily Hu writes that when members of underrepresented communities enter into white color positions, they're more likely to suffer from the imposter syndrome because they don't see people who look like themselves succeeding. Even the term white collar suggests a very male and well, white workplace culture, one where women of color are bound to feel unrecognized. And we don't acknowledge women of color, we ignore their mental health. A 2019 article in the Huffington Post found that the imposter syndrome often results in women of color having low self-esteem and engaging in a constant, endless stream of negative self-talk. In short, women of color become their own worst enemies, limiting themselves from scoring the winning goal asking for a raise, and chasing their wildest dreams. When we don't represent women of color, they struggle to grow. After all, how are you supposed to climb up the ladder of success when you don't even think you should have been on it in the first place? The International Journal of Behavioral Science estimates that 70% of the population will experience the imposter syndrome at some point in their lives. The imposter syndrome is an overwhelmingly common experience, yes. But for women of color, this syndrome isn't something just faced at some point in our life. It is our life. Because when you're told by society that you're not enough because of your race and that you're not enough because of your gender, it becomes hard to believe that anything you do will ever be enough. It's like all the voices in your head are telling you you're not smart enough to get into college without affirmative action. You're not talented enough to be in a final round without a sob story of racism or sexism. You are never enough. And I have had enough. I am tired of being the imposter. And I know I'm not the only one. 
So it's about time we do something about it. And it starts here. First, we need to start hyping ourselves up. As women of color, it can be easy to fall into the mindset that our successes are warranted or deserved. And no one knows this better than star basketball player Bella Allery, whose accomplishments include being player of the year. To combat the imposter syndrome, Bella does something unique. She watches footage of things she does right, rather than focusing on her mistakes. And by doing so, she is able to validate her own success. And we can all do this. For instance, when you get your ballots back after this tournament, focus on positive comments before then turning to critiques. Or if you get a bad grade back at school, focus on the progress you've been able to make in that class, rather than allowing that one grade to define who you are as a student. Because once we're able to see that we're successful, it is so much easier to be it. Next, we must begin to support organizations that encourage meaningful representations of women of color in otherwise white areas. And when I say representation, I mean real, comprehensive representation. You know, not like Netflix always choosing one ethnically ambiguous actor to be in a lead role, but organizations like the Swan Dreams Project aim to help combat the lack of representation of women of color in ballet by not only showing images of Black ballerinas, but by also offering free dance lessons. Because representation isn't just seeing women of color, it's supporting them as well. And by representing more women of color in otherwise white spaces, we can finally overcome the imposter syndrome and start believing that our successes are enough. Today, we've examined how both a lack of research and representation contribute to making the imposter syndrome worse for women of color, its effects, and finally some solutions that we can all implement. And so while I've had my fair share of embarrassing stories in this activity, as it comes to an end, I can say that I'm grateful for all of them. Because every success and every failure has led me to right here. And right now, that's a pretty good place to be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christian. Um, judges, just let me know when you're ready and we can move on to the next person. Sure, I'm ready. All right. Next up is Kahani. Hi. Uh, can Hi. Can you hear and see me? Yes. Awesome. Okay. And uh, whenever I'm ready. Awesome. 2020 was, uh, why didn't I just list all the synonyms for disaster? from murder hornets to the election to, oh yeah, a literal global pandemic. This past year felt like a horrible twist of, wait, there's more. Like, you know a year's bad when the Pentagon releases legitimate videos of UFOs. And we just ignored them. <laughs> we ignored UFOs. How did we simply avoid such a sensational event? Well, the May 23rd, 2020 San Francisco Chronicle details. Amidst the chaos that was this past year, we became desensitized to all the statistics that were thrown at us. These issues arise when we view these statistics as meaningless numbers, rather than vessels that communicate the stories of thousands. We have to stop reducing human beings to data before we replace every diverse human narrative with a simple string of statistics. So let's break the numbers down by analyzing the dehumanizing nature of data and overexposure, looking into the causes before searching for some vital solutions. Because in this dark era of human history, as our compassion continues to crumble, it is only with awareness and dedicated collaboration will we be able to sew back together the pieces of humanity. During COVID, I got like super into watching crime shows, Criminal Minds, Law and Order, Scooby-Doo. At first, whenever a gruesome death was even mentioned, I would freak out. But when I found myself casually eating Cheerios, as the police discussed a case where 27 people had been violently stabbed in the necks 
I realized I had become desensitized, but I'm not alone because overexposure desensitizes us to the struggles of real people. We fail to empathize with the suffering of others when their struggles are masked by the statistics. Many popular video games expose graphic events like decapitation, rape, and murder to adolescents. From being numb to violence because of video games, to sexual abuse because of prejudiced films, increased exposure to human suffering, in turn, numbs us to it. Journalist Kate Morgan describes how after the horrific 2012 Sandy Hook shooting, she threw up in her sink out of horror. But after the 2018 Parkland shooting, she simply skimmed the news alert and then went out to dinner. Our lack of empathy in the face of human suffering showcases, we've become numb to the actual loss of human lives. And alongside people, we fail to understand the severity of global atrocities when they're masked by the statistics. By 2015, the Syrian war claimed 250,000 lives and the world took little notice until a shocking picture surfaced of three-year-old refugee Alam Kurdi lying dead on a beach. Within hours of this picture being posted online, it was on the front page of newspapers worldwide. But when the media went back to reporting indigestible data, Alan Gurdi went from an innocent little boy to a forgotten statistic. From devastating conflicts in the Middle East to the Uyghur Muslim crisis in China, we avoid mass atrocities because we view statistics as hollow numbers. Nobel Peace Prize winner Wishla Washimborska elaborates. History counts its skeletons in round numbers. A thousand and one remains a thousand as if the one had never existed. 83 million, nine, one. So what do these numbers mean? Well, 83 million represents the number of Americans who believe the sun revolves around the earth. Nine is the number of people watching a fantastic oratory right now. And one is the person who forgot a banana in their locker before quarantine started. This just goes to show we can't connect with pure statistics because our compassion has deflated. Now, we don't purposefully try to avoid the lies behind the statistics. We do so because we innately feel keeping cool in the face of mass suffering has its benefits. But by doing so, we lose what makes us human, our deep empathy. Decision-making psychologist Daniel Kahneman elaborates, instead of allowing ourselves to grieve over the suffering of others, we immediately try to control our emotions. Psychology professor Deborah Smalls elaborates, we are facing a global collapse of compassion. As the number of people in need increases, our empathy for them decreases. And in turn, our compassion has died. Additionally, statistics don't impact us because our brains can't process large numbers. Psychic numbing, as coined by psychiatrist Robert J. Lifton, is a psychological phenomenon that causes us to feel indifferent to the suffering of large numbers of people. Now we greatly value saving one life, but as the number of lives at risk increases, psychic numbing actually desensitizes us because what's one more person, right? Even though COVID-19 deaths in the US surpass 9-11 deaths every single day, we remain indifferent. Even though hundreds of thousands of people die in isolation due to this virus on a weekly basis, we remain indifferent. And even though a mob of hundreds stormed the Capitol unmasked and what is now being labeled not just an act of domestic terrorism, but also a super spreader event, we remained indifferent to the point that we failed to convict the person responsible. Our collective ignorance to the human tendency to avoid mass suffering has turned us from characters of compassion to creatures of cruelty. Two years ago, my school went into a lockdown. After it was over, 
we learned that a man with a loaded gun ran across our campus. Security footage showed him racing through the school with hundreds of students milling about, going absolutely unnoticed. Everyone was horrified and I remember hearing a phrase that shook me to my core. Our school almost became a statistic. I realized that if a shooting had occurred, my friends and classmates and teachers would have been reduced to a victim count and tossed aside, lost amidst a sea of statistics. But they have vibrant lives and their stories deserve to be heard. Now, I have to be honest, there isn't a neat end all be all solution to this issue. Numbers will continue to desensitize us and overexposure will continue to numb us. But what we can do is learn to be a little more compassionate. It's time for a desensitization intervention. And I'm just realizing that is a total mouthful. So here's an acronym, ACT, ACT. First, A, acknowledge. Acknowledge your feelings during times of crisis. Express your emotions by calling a friend, using a punching bag, or simply screaming into a pillow. By recognizing your emotions, you'll increase your passion for others. Next, C, care. Care for others in any way you can. Whether it's by delivering meals, donating money, or sewing masks, when you do something to help, you'll be showing compassion and actively contributing to solving a crisis. Finally, T, think. Think of the individuality. When you see statistics relaying the struggles of others, try to imagine the lives behind them. The New York Times embraced this concept. They marked 100,000 COVID-19 deaths in the US, not by boxing these victims into a single statistic, but by creating a list of names with a description that depicted the uniqueness of each life lost. We will never forget Lila A. Fenwick, the first black woman to graduate from Harvard Law, or Fred Walter Gray, who liked his bacon and hash browns crispy, or William D. Greek, who thought it was important to know every person's story. It is paramount. We acknowledge the stories behind the data and see the value of their existences, not as a mere statistical calculation, but as a vibrant celebration. It's time to act. Now, data is extremely important, but it's when we overvalue data and dehumanize lives that we must look behind the statistics and amplify the narratives. If we can learn to be compassionate, even in the face of data overload, we will learn to grow, to love, to thrive. Thank you so much, Kahani. Joe, just let me know when you're ready so we can move forward. Cool. Yeah, I'm ready. Awesome. Okay, next up, we're gonna go with Elizabeth. Hello. Hello. Can you hear and see me okay? Give me Amazing. A I can't see you. Oh, oh, one second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, please go ahead. Oh, okay. am I good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, amazing, thank you. I'm a lot to handle. It's probably because there are four personalities in me always fighting over what to do. My lazy side wants to be sleeping 24 seven, but 
the hormonal foodie in me just wants to gorge on that gallon of mashed potatoes sitting in my fridge. My inner angsty teen wants to binge watch 15 seasons of Grey's Anatomy while connected to all three of my family's Wi-Fi routers. And of course, my productivity princess stresses me out with what feels like the never ending schoolwork. With my scattered sense of self, it can be hard to find a place where I really feel seen. But there's one place in this world that can satisfy all my wonky and weird desires. Costco! Nowhere else can you buy a Tempur-Pedic mattress, rotisserie chicken, high-speed Wi-Fi routers, and of course, the most pristine highlighters on the market. Uh, what can I say? Costco gets me. And it's not just the low prices. It's that they acknowledge all aspects of me. The bum, the foodie, the teen, and the student all thrive within those warehouse walls. But I'm afraid that unlike Costco, our society doesn't share the same wholesale spirit. Whether it be race, religion, gender, or hobby, we tend to think of our identity in one word sound bites. When that gets complicated, rather than confronting complexity, we run for the hills. According to researchers at the University of Pennsylvania, our society is constructed on single category dimensions with little focus on the intersections of multiple dimensions. Too often we trade our intersectional identities for one dimensional roles. We make things comfortable for other people. But University of Maryland professor, Dr. Patricia Hill Collins says that by doing so, we lose sight of the differences that reflect our privilege or oppression. So today, Let's discuss how we use one dimensional thinking, then examine the harms before finally finding some solutions you'll want to buy in bulk. The evolution of humans relied heavily on our ability to assess a situation by just looking at it. However, when we place this strictly visual assessment to people, we strip all dimensions from our complex identities with our shallow minded thinking. We gave in to the beloved American novelist Ernest Hemingway's iceberg theory of admission. The theory states that the obvious aspects of a story above the water are visible, but beneath the surface lies a greater portion with deeper meaning that we simply omit. This goes beyond the pages of our required reading into the rhetoric of our daily lives. The William Ant Law Review explains that we unintentionally apply the iceberg theory to those around us in our awareness is the 10% that we can see, such as race or age, but the 90% of our identities, including our religions, values and beliefs lie out of awareness. So while you're looking at the 10% of me right now, woman, Asian, public speaker, you don't see the 90% of me. That triggered my seven-year-old self to pull the fire alarm at Costco. Things got a little hectic in aisle 89 by accepting the tip of the iceberg. We fail to acknowledge various factors of hosts submerged beneath the waves. But within ourselves, we push singular identities above the water. Duke University professor Sarah Gather points out that people do in fact claim distinct and overlapping identities at different times, but simply do not take the next step to combine them. Given the situation, we reveal aspects of ourselves that we see fit, but when the opportunity presents itself for our intersectionalities to cross, rather than embracing it, the annual review of sociology in 2017 finds that at each intersection, an individual chooses to take on a single identity. Essentially, we disregard all aspects of ourselves except one, leaving us as fractions and deeming ourselves one dimensional definitions. Unfortunately, our underappreciation for intersectionality is represented in the entertainment industry. When casting, directors usually require actors and actresses to only fit one aspect of a character's identity, rather than all of it, with the usual justification of widening the talent pool. However, by doing so, entertainment not only misrepresents and underrepresents identity groups, but perpetrates the one-dimensional stereotypes present within society. Movies Love, Simon, and Call Me By Your Name have grown in popularity as people praise having gay men presented on the big screen. However, given that the movies follow stories of white men, the LGBTQ community has spoken out about the difference in experience for LGBTQ members 
of color. In response to this, writer Michael Arnox of NBC admits, I don't have to see myself in a story to relate to it, but it'd be nice for once. While it's a nice sentiment to want to display every identity on the big screen, the entertainment industry runs a risk of isolating and ignoring the people who lie on the intersections of those communities. And when intersectionality is not defined and represented, it leaves our negative biases to define people for us. This is when we label black women as angry, foregoing their womanhood. When we pit ignorant jokes to Asian American individuals, disregarding their cultural pride. And when we label Republicans as racist or even Democrats as snowflakes without looking further into their individual intentions. Intersectionality may exist in the hidden parts of our identities, but the consequences we face when those identities are ignored are omnipresent. Seems far from us, but I see it all around me. When people look at my dad, they see a stereotypical Asian male running a dry cleaners. And at work, I guess that's what he is. But what they don't know is that he gave up his Olympic cross country skiing lifestyle and sport in South Korea to move his family to the United States for his children's education. When people look at me, they see a basic whitewashed Asian girl just trying to fit in. And in some cases, I guess that's true. But I am a Korean American immigrant child born and raised in a Catholic household. And while my Asian background makes it look like I'm good at calculus, emphasis on look, and my Catholic religion makes it seem like I'm at peace at heart, in reality, when I was faced with a mental health crisis, my religion told me to turn to prayer. And my Asian background, well, it told me to suck it up. How can we stay afloat? when our entire identity, both good and bad, isn't even seen. Since 1989, Costco has expanded from selling common business supplies to becoming my go-to supplier for the best discounted Mother's and Father's Day gifts to maintain my role as the favorite child, and of course, the best trees, lights, and ribbons to satisfy my Catholic Christmas cravings. Oh, Costco, intersectionality king. But we don't have to be a multi-million dollar corporation to understand intersectionality. I don't even have multi $10 in my bank account. As individuals, we must make the effort to combine all of our separated identities into one whole aspect of ourselves. To do this, we must first acknowledge all of our identities. The University of Michigan has created the Social Identity Wheel, a simple worksheet found online designed to prompt individuals to identify both their hidden and seen identities right in front of them. In doing so, the Harvard Business Review challenges us all to redefine the way we think of ourselves in three steps. First, reflect on your complexity. Think back to the roots of your background and the optimal moments that created your ideals. Second, move away from that zero sum thinking about who you are. Acknowledge that you are more than one identity but rather a beautiful blossoming of many. And third and most importantly, create and leverage connections between your identities. Make the time to realize combinations within yourself. For me, that's being more vulnerable within my religion as I move away from those racial stereotypes I place on myself. Our intersectionalities create jumbled, silly stringed messes of personality. But when we take a step back, they turn out to be gorgeously unique mandalas of our souls. Aside from their product inclusivity, Costco thrives on the fact that they promote from within, something that we could all learn. Let's reach past the warehouse exteriors of our appearances and acknowledge all aisles of ourselves. Open those around us to the entirety of our identity, not just part of it. And in seeing others' intersectionalities, we're in for some great Costco-worthy Connections. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, let me know when you are ready. We can move on to the next one.
Can I get the topic for Casey in the chat? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I'm ready. All right, next up is Casey. All right, is everyone ready for me to begin? Excellent. Yeah. I have a confession to make. I have not been social distancing. Oh, don't get me wrong. I am physically separated, but my social life is better than ever before. Every day I'm chilling with chickens, hanging with hippos, resting with rhinos, alliterating with alligators, because I'm playing Nintendo's best-selling video game, Animal Crossing New Horizons. Animal Crossing is so appealing because it lets players escape the anxieties and responsibilities of the real world, like paying off debt, getting a job, and doing chores, by paying off debt, getting a job, and doing chores on an island. And the best part is these virtual animals appreciate me. They ask how I'm doing, give me gifts, and even help pay off my student loans, the ultimate millennial fantasy. Millennials are so desperate to be debt-free, even their escapism centers on solvency. Unfortunately, while millions of Americans like me thrive in a virtual world, real life relationships suffer. The Personality and Social Psychology Review discovered American levels of empathy declined nearly 50% in the last 30 years alone. Even before COVID, we had a connection crisis. And now it's even worse. That's my concern. I fear that in a time when many of us increasingly feel defined by division, we need to reclaim our forgotten sense of shared understanding. We must practice what author Peter Laughter calls radical empathy, striving to understand the feelings and experiences of others, especially when they differ from ours. And that is no laughtering matter. We'll first look at why the cup of modern empathy feels empty. Next, consider the harms of a polarized society before finally exploring how to rediscover mutual understanding. Because sooner or later, we'll have to turn off Nintendo and reprogram the real world. In the words of the late great American philosopher, George Carlin, have you ever noticed that anybody driving slower than you is an idiot and anyone going faster than you is a maniac? This tendency to center ourselves above others is indicative of the first reason why we fail to empathize. It's called the fundamental attribution error. That's the human propensity to judge ourselves by our thoughts and intentions, but everyone else by their actions. This bias makes sense. After all, we automatically know our own character and motivations, and we can't see inside each other's minds. But when unchecked, it turns us 
to hypocrites. It's why a young CEO, John Winning, he was slammed entitled millennials for their filthy entitled entitlement after being handed his CEO job from his dad, who's probably named like Victor Victory. It's why the director of ICE deportations insisted they can't be compared to Nazis because they're just following orders as opposed to the Nazis who, you know, each did their own thing. This self-centeredness leads to hypocrisy instead of harmony. I once thought my friend double-crossed me in Animal Crossing. It looked like he stole fruit from my tree. Turns out he needed an apple to plant his own apple tree and was planning on sending me his new crop as a gift. Because I jumped to conclusions, I only harvested his hurt feelings. As I learned, not seeing the other side harms us both individually and socially. Stanford psychologist Jamil Zaki reports, people who don't practice radical empathy are more likely to become stressed and depressed. Less understanding spouses have shorter and unhappier marriages because staying stuck in self-centeredness gets in the way of talking things through. Amazingly, researchers with the Journal of Health Psychology can watch young couples speak for 20 minutes and predict future divorces with 80% accuracy. To the subject's incredulity, less empathy begets less self-awareness. Now, I don't mean to be controversial. And I know I don't know the ideology of all my judges and fellow contestants, but I'm still gonna say it. Poverty is bad. Thank you. No, thank you. Facile statements and easy solutions are not how we solve dwindling empathy. What I'm asking for is difficult. We've grown accustomed to our disconnected society that treats people like problems. It's becoming harder than ever to deeply listen to those who challenge us since we can retreat online and surround ourselves with echo chambers of purely supportive voices. Radical empathy is a radical proposition, but we'll never bridge these social schisms without it. On a personal level, I understand how hard it is to push past the pain. My dad didn't make it easy for us. He attacked me, dragged me by the ear, and threw me in a closet. Because of him, my mom's sister and I lost our home. I was filled with so much resentment. I kept thinking, he's just a terrible person. Someone I could never understand. I carry the mental burden of that grudge every day. But holding on to anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. It took radical empathy for me to put the pieces together. I learned my dad was seriously abused as a kid. He didn't understand the impact of his actions because that violence was all he knew. I didn't justify or excuse his behavior but I tried to understand it. I let go of the burdens of the past weighing me down and hindering my happiness because when we don't release our pain, we allow the very events that hurt us to lodge rent-free in our minds forever reliving the original torment. Radical empathy brings us closer to the truth. We have more in common than we know. Scars, and all. It's time to turn off Animal Crossing. Now we're at an all too human crossroads between turmoil and togetherness. Let's start by practicing radical empathy in our political conversations. Instead of disparaging and dehumanizing those with whom we disagree, let's debate opinions. That doesn't mean we roll over to accommodate viewpoints that cause real harm. It means we deeply consider how and why our fellow Americans reach conclusions. If we think all Democrats are communists or all Republicans fascists, we'll never change anyone's mind. Radical empathy benefits you far more than whom you're understanding. 
Consider Daryl Davis, an African-American man who attended KKK rallies to understand why such a hateful, racist group acts as they do. Davis didn't attend just to be kind to the KKK or voice his support, but to understand them. And it worked out in his favor because his bravery and radical empathy caused over 200 Klansmen to renounce their membership and recommit their lives to tolerance. So how can we follow in Davis's footsteps and finally conquer the fundamental attribution error? We can't. Just kidding. According to psychology expert Patrick Hewis of Mind Maven, we need only follow three steps. One, don't make assumptions. Assumptions are the enemy of empathy. Seldom can our assumptions paint a full and accurate picture of the problems and motives a person is facing. Two, listen more than you speak. By hearing others' ideas without interjecting your own, you can get an honest understanding of how that person thinks and then make up your mind for yourself. And finally, understand empathy is a skill. And the more you practice it, the easier deploying radical empathy will become. By understanding the conditions that create these horrific situations, by treating the causes instead of attacking the symptoms, we can prevent them from happening again. 160,000 kids miss school every day out of fear of being bullied by someone who doesn't understand them. The clear choice to embrace radical empathy and compassion is ours, now more than ever. If we start to care for each other, as much as the characters of Animal Crossing care for us, we won't need to visit an online island to feel understood. As the proverb goes, if you wanna go quickly, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Judges, whenever you're ready, let me know. Hey, Paige, can you ping the topic in the chat, please? All right. Yeah, I'm ready. All right, awesome. whenever you are ready, let's give it up for Paige. We all know this kind of person, the kind of person who uses reusable cloth bags at the grocery store, the kind of person who always says no to a straw when they go to Starbucks, who spends their weekends always busy at the local animal shelter. You know, the kind of person that you're torn between being jealous of and angry at because they are the picture perfect activist. And I would bet money the person springing to mind bears no resemblance whatsoever to the multimillionaire, reality star, and makeup mogul, the one and only Kylie Jenner. But in 2020, Jenny decided to don her activist cloak. And during the Australian wildfires, decided to speak up for animals, sharing animal rights funds on her social media platforms. But it was within the same Instagram story that Jenner also posted the following. A photo of Louis Vuitton slippers and a brand new pedicure. But the slip up was that the Louis Vuitton slippers were made of real mink fur. The internet was quick to brand Kylie's activism as hypocritical being heartbroken over the death of animals in one breath, but wearing expensive animal fur on her feet in the very next. 
But it is this detachment from the reality of our activism that what we say and do, what we advocate for must be followed up with execution and intention that is a phenomenon far from exclusive to Jenner and the celebrity elite, the one that you and I are just as guilty of. In a world where everything we do is glorified and trendified, how do we reconnect our activism back down to earth and disconnect from performative activism? But to understand performative activism, we must step into our role as actors by first hitting the lights so that we can enlighten ourselves on what it means to be an activist and why we often fall short. Next, we will hit the stage and watch our modern slacktivism unfold before finally taking our bows and seeing how we may be able to close the curtain on performative activism once and for all. But for now, let's hit the lights. Whenever we are young, one of the early golden rules that we are taught is how to be kind and that sharing is caring. And as an only child like myself, this may have been a difficult lesson to get down, but it was one that was worth mastering because it served as not only my first exposure to compassion and community, but to the need for activism. Activism is defined by the Cambridge Dictionary as the use of direct and noticeable action to achieve a result usually a social or political one. Now, I know that that is one of the most vague definitions that you could possibly think of, but it's fitting because activism's broad nature is simultaneously its greatest strength and downfall. On one hand, the broad nature of activism allows for a broad amount of activist actions from going to protests, signing petitions, rallies, community service, volunteer hours, and more. The accessibility of becoming an activist is higher now than ever. But on the other hand, we put the action in activism on the back burner and set the standards for being an activist so high that many of us are afraid that we will never be able to achieve it. And for those who try to achieve it, feel as if they never quite measure up to our picture-perfect lens on activism. But it's not perfection that our current state of activism is lacking. It's altruism. Defined by the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, human altruism is the concept where one does something for the sake of another rather than for the sake of oneself. But our activism today has been leaning far away from altruism and it's become performative. When our time at the animal shelter becomes a great place to take Instagram photos, because how else will my followers know that I am a good person? And when all of our community service is meticulously written down so that we can put it on an application, our activism is less about the community and more about ourselves. But this raises the question, if people are still doing activist actions, why does the intention of altruism or performativeness matter? Why is it bad if we reap the benefits of what we do as well? And for this, we must hit the stage and understand the current state of slacktivism. Because activism is easier at our fingertips than ever, with websites like change.org allowing the signing of petitions to take merely seconds. GoFundMe pages making donations of money absolutely effortless, and organizations sending cute commemorative t-shirts and blankets whenever you donate. Our activism today is so simple, feel good, rewarding that it's just too good to be true. Because GoFundMe is infamous for scammers. Change.org doesn't meet the legal requirements to ever make some real change. And when organizations focus on the donors rather than the receivers, their charitable promises often falter. On the humanitarian side of things, YouTuber Hiram Yarbrough exposed the state of slacktivism in a video titled, I was a humanitarian and I regret it. He detailed that for years he traveled to African nations to build homes and provide meals. But in the comments, a Rwandan woman named Kagina Laura explained it best, that she, as a senior, was on the receiving eye, a side of aid. 
And on the receiving side of aid, she was asked for a photo more than she was even asked what her own name was. She was asked more times how she was able to function in a third world country instead of any help being offered because the volunteers cared more about their benefit, treating their mission trip like a tourist excursion rather than as an activist mission. And this pattern of activism gone wrong runs closer to home as well, so close that it's in our phones. Just last summer, the hashtag Blackout Tuesday went viral on Instagram. And instead of truly empowering black voices like it was meant to do, 11.3 million users posted a blank black square and called it a day. And instead of listening and uplifting black voices, organizing actual effective change, people did the bare minimum social media post and called it a day. The easy slacktivism that we often resort to affects the state of activism as a whole because no longer is activism treated as an effective way to change our world. And with such a deeply ingrained issue, how exactly are we able to close the curtain once and for all? The first step is to look behind the curtain and educate yourself and others on how to become an effective activist, to understand why change.org petitions entitled End the Violence in Yemen, spoiler alert, don't end the violence in Yemen with the click of a button. To educate yourself and others when activism runs shallow. And to be able to admit that you might be a hypocrite. But don't worry, I am just as bad. My sophomore year of high school, I joined my school's community service club known as Key Club. And all I managed to do in a year of activist opportunities was well, I mean, I ate the cupcakes at our meetings, but that was it. I instead reaped the benefits of saying I was a member of Key Club, writing it down on my National Honor Society, writing it in my Instagram bio, taking photos with my friends, before realizing that I was being so performative that I wasn't doing anything for my community, but instead reaping the benefits of what helping my community would do to help me and my social standing. And with that comes our second step. For us to be able to end the performance and take our bows, we must be able to use our tools. The tools that we are given to become an activist, to use our voice that we are given to speak out against shallow performative activism to call out the organizations like Speech and Debate itself that claim to promote diversity and inclusion and yet award speeches that are sharing stories that aren't theirs to tell. Or debaters when they run feminism and racism arguments, but their activism never leaves the tournament, but reaps the praise. To use our hands and our feet and our hearts to serve, to be able to go and fight the national blood shortage if you are eligible to donate to go to your local Habitat for Humanity and aid our rising homelessness crisis, to go out and donate food for those who are in need. Because when the world calls for the lights to turn on and the cameras are looking and action is needed, will you be there to pick up the slack with me? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Judges, let me know when you are ready for our final speaker. Yeah, I'm ready. All right. Our final speech speaker is Blythe.
Can you see and hear me? Yep. Judges ready? Yes. May 3rd, 2016, a day that would be remembered by women across the country forever. It would change the way that we saw our world, the way we saw love, and the way that we saw ourselves. The day Beyonce dropped the Lemonade album. <laughs> now, this may not have been significant to you, but it certainly was to me. Because one, I was shocked that someone cheated on Beyonce. I mean, what hope do the rest of us have? Come on, we're talking Sasha Fierce, Big B, and that B stands for bands, Carrie Destiny's Child on her back, Beyonce. Then two, the fact that a love song about a woman scorned wasn't her wondering where she went wrong or what she could have done to make him stay, but instead her feelings of anger, pity, and disgust for the man who left her behind. And that's not something we see very often. In fact, we tend to see the opposite. Maybe it happened when someone ran into you on the train or they interrupted you in a conversation. You said sorry, then you didn't have to. According to Dr. Karina Schufman from the University of Philadelphia, women not only report themselves committing more offenses, but apologize more often for doing so. Women are quite literally apologizing for existing. So today, let's Hold up and examine the situation at hand, see how sorry affects us on a daily basis, and finally, find our freedom from this prison of apologies. While sorry may be the song in which Beyonce addresses Jay-Z's infidelities, it's in Daddy Lessons that we get a good look at her childhood. In it, she croons of how her father cheated on her mother, as Jay would to her years later, which is to say, we are what we learn from our parents, and girls are taught to be apologetic from a young age. In his book, The Triple Bind, Dr. Stephen Hinshaw, director of psychology at the University of Berkeley, California, reports that girls are given an impossible standard, taught to be confident, but always downplay it so that you aren't prideful, taught to speak your mind so long as you aren't the loudest in the room, and taught that we can be great leaders just so long as whatever we do or say is followed up by the word sorry. But the thing about sorry is that it immediately downplays whatever precedes it. So even brilliant ideas remain forgotten. Take for example, an article written in the Washington Post in 2015. In it, they recount some of history's greatest quotes, if said by a woman in a boardroom meeting. <laughs> yeah, imagine if, give me liberty or give me death, was instead said like, hi, I'm sorry, Dave. I just think that liberty is so important, you know? And well, the alternative is so much worse. I, am I making any sense here? See, bright ideas get forgotten when they're surrounded by filibustering sorries and asking for affirmations from coworkers. But what happens when women aren't apologetic? is often much darker. In her song, Don't Hurt Yourself, Yonce further examines her unapologetic energy. She raps, blindly in love, I'll mess with you till I realize I'm just too much for you. Which is her telling Jay-Z that when he hurts her, he's only hurting himself. And we tend to hurt ourselves rather often, which in a way means that we're all miniature Jay-Z's. However, not all of us make millions when we're assertive. In fact, women often face direct consequences from doing so. Take, for example, an article written by Madeline Hyman from the University of New York. In it, she says that when women are kind and considerate, they're seen as nice people, but not great leaders. However, when women are dominating and assertive in the conversation, they're seen as bright future CEOs for their company. Yeah, I'm kidding. Everybody calls them a bitch, but like, imagine if that was just the world we live in. <laughs> the point is, whether women are direct or docile, we still face consequences that our male counterparts do not. And this doesn't only affect us in the boardroom, but also in our day-to-day -day lives. 
Take, for example, the US Open final two years ago. It was a heated match between Naomi Osaka and Serena Williams. Serena was given a penalty for breaking her racket on the court floor and asking the referee for an apology after he gave her a sc bad score for something often seen in the world of men's tennis. However, when a woman reacted this way, the next morning she was depicted in a cartoon by the Herald Sun as having monstrously large muscles, a clownishly large nose and lips and throwing a tantrum on the court floor. As her referee looks onto the calm, skinny, white opponent and asks, can't you just let her win? Let her win. With three words, he has diminished her 23 national titles to a plaything. But this comic shows a dark and universal truth for women. When we don't apologize for ourselves, we face the brunt of ostracization, national humiliation, and the questioning of our femininity. This problem doesn't only affect our big time tennis stars and businesswomen, but also our teenage girls. And I know it may be hard to believe that a talented, beautiful, intelligent, clever, witty, amazing, and not to mention humble young woman like myself would struggle with apologies. But I do, rather often, in fact. I attend a small Southern school that is 97% white. So more often than not, I am the token black girl. Literally, my school has a 20 foot poster of my face in front of the school, despite having 20 black kids attending. I was at a football game with a boy I kind of had a thing with. Like we weren't dating, but he said he liked my high top, so we were basically engaged. Everything was going fine until halftime. Someone pulled out a speaker and started playing music. And I quickly found myself surrounded by people I would attend school with for the next four years, shouting out the N-word. And I don't mean mumbling it, I mean looking me in the eyes with a confidence that I will never have. I was shocked into silence, but I gathered up all the courage I had in my 13 year old self and I said, I'm sorry, but it makes me feel weird when you use the N word. I was sorry that a bunch of white kids using a word with 400 years of history behind it made me feel weird. But I was quickly bombarded by questions of why I had to be such a buzzkill and lectures on how the word barely had meaning anymore. I just got up and left. I don't remember the score of the game that night, but I remember how it felt to cry alone. And I know that it took me three years before I confronted my friend and asked him why he didn't stand up for me. And as I began my big angry rant, I started by apologizing if my tears made him feel guilty. And even now I want to apologize for telling you not to apologize when I apologize all the time. But every time that I apologize for speaking my mind, it's because the world has taught me I'm not meant to. And when girls apologize for being bumped into, it's because they think they're not supposed to take up space. But we can change this. Because if there's one thing Beyonce taught me, it's how to take my lemons and make lemonade. Okay, ladies, now let's get in formation. But this formation extends to our gentlemen as well. This problem won't be easy to solve, but we can get inspiration from someone who inspires even Beyonce, Barbie. In her new YouTube style vlogs, Barbie informs to her young viewers that the word sorry has become a reflex for us, but we can switch up the narrative by changing the way that we speak. So instead of I'm sorry, try a excuse me, or take a note from our vice president and try a I'm speaking right now. And men, this extends to you too. Like I tell my dad, apologizing is a lot like moisturizing. I'm begging you to try it. <laughs> but seriously, according to psychology today, men often perceive apologies as a weakness. When in reality, it takes great personal strength to acknowledge a mistake you've made and do something about it. So the next time you cut someone off, apologize and create an atmosphere for your female friends and coworkers to speak their minds without fear of facing retribution. What happened to me at that football game is something I'll never forget. But I know, 
The next time I'm somewhere speaking my mind and someone tries to cut me down, I'll speak up even louder. And just like Beyonce, I ain't sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, congratulations to everyone for making the quarterfinals of Original Oratory. What a great round. Thank you for making it a hard decision for us judges. Yeah. Could I say one thing? Um, Blythe, yeah. you, could you turn your camera on? Uh, yes. Sorry, it takes a second to start up. No, that's fine. Um, for everyone, I just want to say like this is a good camera angle. I keep giving this note in every round. Um, it's just put your camera at like shoulder height so that you're at a good frame for yourself. And I think Blythe does this well. So that's why I said told her to put her camera on. But it's I, it's a note that I literally have given every single round, and I don't know if people understand it. So I figured show an example. But yes, thank you. Thank you. Great job, everyone. Great job, everybody. Thank you, everybody. So thank you for judging. Have bye. A nice have a good night. Have a good night. Yeah. Bye.